Um, I'll be talking more from a business perspective, uh, but also uh, I, I really think there's a huge connection with uh, policy makers and, 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 and making a better world. Uh, so um, really thank you for the invitation. I really appreciate that. So I'll, I'll take you some, uh, through some, uh, it's not academic research, but research I spent a lot of time. I'll start with good news. I'll give you some bad news and I'll give you finish with some good news. There's going to be a small case study that we will work together. So all that in 45 minutes. Um, my love to project management started when I was fired from a big consulting firm. Um, I was high up on the hierarchy and I wanted to become partner and the, and the partner said, listen, uh, project management is not something for senior leaders. It's not strategic, anybody can do it, it's low cost. It's a commodity, so thank you very much, Antonio, but you're out. And, and I said, how can smart people, educated people, ignore the value of project management? How is that possible? How, how can policymakers uh, don't see the value of projects? How can uh, CEOs don't see the value of projects? I, it couldn't, I just couldn't get it. I just didn't understand. And there was a big gap. There was a, a glass ceiling that uh, I wanted to break. So I've dedicated about 20 years to try to understand why senior leaders don't appreciate the value of project management, and then how can we shape that? How can we change that? So one of the big findings of my research was that business schools don't teach project management. In the MBAs, just top 100 MBAs, just to teach project management. The rest are just uh, elective, so we're changing that. I've changed yesterday, Hulk University in Dubai said we want that for our MBA. So slowly we're getting to business schools to uh, embrace project management as a core skill for future leaders. So, but there was a huge gap. Um, so I tried to influence uh, senior leaders. I, I said I want to influence through PMI. Uh, and I was chairman of the Project Management Institute 2016. I was board member. But one, two main things I wanted to do in, uh, as chairman of PMI, I, I launched the Brightline Initiative. I don't know if you're familiar, but was a sort of a think tank connecting uh, a consortium of uh, partners, education uh, companies to influence, to connect the gap between our uh, strategy and projects. Uh, so that happened for about five years. The other thing, I, uh, my goal was to create with IPMA uh, uh, all, the, all the great uh, associations around project management uh, that we were not working together. I thought we had to work together. Uh, I failed on that. Uh, I think there is a lot to do in the association world on project management to co-create, and we're not doing that. So that was in 2016. I, I left PMI for a few years now. But um, so, and the other big for me, my goal, I failed on my PhD. I didn't manage to finish. Uh, so I, I'm really proud to see so many young students and, and also academic already here that you made it. But I, what I wanted to do is I want to publish with HBR. In the business world, there's nothing more influential than Harvard Business Review. And they had ignored project management for years. The latest book on project management is like 10 years old and pff, like not really uh, to the point. And so I was pleased to convince them after five years and said, listen, projects are important. Uh, and we got published uh, the book last year, but more important is the magazine who finally dedicated the theme around project management in November, December, uh, with one of my articles, but more other, uh, the other professor and Ami on the psychological safety in projects. So has been really focused on shaping and trying to influence senior leaders. So my talk is about that. Uh, these are some of the clients I've been advising, consulting, just quickly. Uh, Ten years ago, I got calls from project managers. Listen, my project is not working. Five years ago, I got uh, calls from project management offices. They said, listen, we have a challenge here and we don't know how to. Today, I get calls from CEOs, senior leaders, saying, listen, I have a problem. Yes, so senior leaders are finally understanding that this is a big issue. And the chief editor of HBR, Harvard Business Review, told me, Antonio, listen, your projects are your future. And I say, yes, Adi, and you cannot imagine how badly and poorly projects are managed by senior leaders, by CEO, by politicians, because they don't understand the fundamentals. So we need to do something about that. And the second call, the call that I get most often now is this one. Listen, Antonio, I don't know how many projects we have in this organization. I don't have a clue. Nobody knows. 
And second, they say, I think we have more projects than employees. How do I manage that? True, this is coming from top CEOs, top companies around the world, uh, and, and leaders. We don't know, can you help? So that's, I think, great for us, for our practitioners and experts in this field, because finally, the recognition is there. So I'm going to cover four things. Just the project economy, which is uh, a bit the theme of what you're talking. Then I think a painful point. I think we need to disrupt project management, and I will tell you about that. And then I will present a very simple framework, finish that with that. So the project economy, macro level is clear. We are going to see more projects now than in the last century. If you look at numbers through the recovery from the post pandemic, we're talking about 30, 40 trillion uh, from EU funding, from the US, everywhere there's projects because this is worse than any crisis we've ever seen. So at macro level is clear, projects are everywhere and we need more project managers. My interest more than field is more the future of work. And if you look at one organization, one company, uh, many years ago, like when uh, you had Taylor and, and, and all these people and, and, and Henry Ford, and uh, the Foucault, uh, work was operations, operational activities, right? Production and, and all these, and most of the people, these are people, resources, working, uh, budgets, management attention was dedicated to the day-to-day -to -day activities, running the organization, running a state, running. That was the focus of everybody, resources. Projects were just nice to have, yeah? And very few people were working in projects, company didn't have many projects. But over the years, the decades, we've become better with, pro uh, with running the business, running the organization, more automation, more total quality management, Six Sigma, all the things, uh, uh, ERP system, SAP system. So operations have shrunk. And what you have on the other side is more projects. Obviously, the world is changing faster. There's more technology. So what you see is there, there's a slight shift over this year. There was a slight shift of resources shifting from pro operational activity to project-based work. Uh, what does it mean? People still had a job on the blue side, but at the same time they were having projects. Can you please join this project? And then can you please join that other project? And then the other project? The big, the big resignation in the US is not because more operational work. The big resignation in the US is because there's so much projects and people cannot cope with that. Yeah, there's a urgency every day, there's a deadline every Friday, and people are fed up with that. There's no prioritization. So that's the big issue is that uh, projects have overtaken. And the big disruption for me is not AI. The big disruption that the world is seeing is the future of work. Because when AI and robots take over and they become cheap to implement, like in a bank, I worked for a bank for seven years, you see more technology than bankers. Why? Because AI take the operational work. So what happened in banking, like a bank in BNB Paribas or ING, is that today you have um, most of the people working project-based and in agile teams. So that's huge disruption. It's not that the project managers will have more work. We're talking about 60 to 70% of the employees, private, public sector, uh, working project-based, and they're not prepared. They're not prepared. We are prepared, but we need to change. That's, I'm coming to that next. I did some research survey with HBR um, for the book, and we noticed that 80% of the executive, 1,200 uh, replies, said 80% 80, 80 said project management and projects are essential for the future of organizations. So there's some sort of awareness among senior leaders that they need to get better. Um, I'm not going to go too much into detail on this one, but just highlighting a couple of things. Uh, to, to be successful in a world driven by operations, the blue part when that was the priority, you need attributes in your business, in your organization, to be successful there. To be successful in a world driven by change, which is driven by agile and projects, is a very different set of attributes. And these are conflicting, right? And this is where most of the organizations are struggling today. I just pick up a few. To be successful in the world of driven by operations day to day, the culture tends to be command and control. Everything is decided at the top. We just tell you and you just do. To be successful in a world driven by projects and change, you need to be, have a different culture. It's about entrepreneurship. It's about collaboration. It's about co-creation. Very different, right? Um, 
the focus in the past was about really cost, volumes, efficiency, products. The focus today in most business is about transformation, innovation, right? And these are completely different because cost is, is against transformation and, and innovation, right? So there's a huge friction in terms of how do we organize organization, businesses today. The skills, deep expertise, that's what we built for 80 years. Deep expertise is you're an expert in marketing, you're an expert in finance, spend 25 years or all your career doing the same thing in the same field. We have millions of those, right? That's what we do. Deep generalists, we don't have. We don't have. Even project managers, they're not yet deep, deep uh, generalists. But that's what businesses did. This is what AI will take over. I wrote an HBR post article a month ago, I said the role of the chief operating officer, number two in every organization, is dead. We don't need them. If 20% of the business is operations instead of 18, why do we need that? We need the chief project officer, not a PMO. It's very different. And, and last one, you know this for sure, but you were talking Mutu as well, is that the way you organize yourself, the structures which are fundamental to, for organizations, this was great, great, the best model to be successful in a world driven by efficiency, hierarchical, top down. What's, this is a disaster. If you want to do a digital transformation project in a hierarchy, you're dead. It's going to fail 100%, 100%, no doubt. You need a much flatter organization. So the problem is companies I'm advising, L'Oreal, a French a huge group, uh, Moody's, they say, how can I shift? I need that part. We need that. You cannot be there. If you're a startup, you go there straight away, right? You don't want this. But most of organization, universities, I'm sorry to say that, they're very much here too, yeah? Uh, how do they get some agility? How do you get more project-driven work? How can they change the structure, the mindset, the culture? And so I spent a lot of time there having lots of fun because it's not black and white. Uh, uh, but this is a big issue everywhere, public sector, the same. Some kind of highlights, just not to bother you too much with uh, details, but job descriptions. I don't know if you're familiar with the thing called job description. This is a thing from the past. This, this was great when you were operational. Companies today, uh, IBM for example, they had 100,000 job descriptions, they're all dead. Why? Because people working in priorities, they were working in new projects with their clients. How can you put that in a job description traditionally in a box? So I think that's a concept which is dead. COOs is dead. Job descriptions is dead. PMOs are dead. The models that we know. Because PMOs, everywhere you see, it's a box in a hierarchy, right? I've been in a PMO. You try to be as high as possible in the hierarchy. We're saying hierarchies are dead. So we need to reinvent PMOs too. Right? To be more agile, to be more strategic, to focus maybe on other topics than just, I'm extreme in my, thing, in my talk, I know there's always in between, so, but resource allocation, this is a funny concept because I fail many times, I try to use resource planning, so where are people working, how much capacity do I have? That was great when you had the blue space. Everything is a bit stable, you can put people in a box, you know where they will be in the next six months to 12 months to a year. But try to mix that, try to mix that with people working on temporary assignments, project based. It's impossible, it doesn't work, right? So these are all concepts that we try to keep pushing forward when the world has changed. And at one point we need to say, hey, let's stop, let's think and reinvent. Prioritization and focus is one of the biggest challenges that senior leaders have. I was talking to a CEO of a big, big company. They told me, he told me, Antonio, we have 1,200 strategic initiatives. <laughs> uh, what? How many projects do you have? I don't know. Which one is more important of these strategic initiatives? They're all important. But <laughs> My God, so a lot of work there. This is a big challenge. Project managers, and I talk in every PM forum, we need to change, and I'm coming to that. Okay, we need to disrupt and focus on other things. Uh, the good thing about this, we that we love this, uh, profession is that for so far, um, when you talk about project management competencies, you say train project managers, right? They need to get better. The thing different now is train everybody, train the whole organization. Please, we need these skills. It's not just project managers or PMOs or agile, everyone. 
needs these skills, which is great. Um, and I love this because it was, uh, I hate the debate, water for all agile. I'm going to cover that briefly. What a mistake. It's not just me, Antonio, with my simple research saying this is the world. I've cut a lot, but McKinsey, for example, uh, six months ago, they were saying, what are the most important skills that you need to build after the pandemic? And project management, McKinsey never talks about project management. It's like my partners, this, this is a, a mundane, a, a commodity. Suddenly they say, well, actually project management is important. When I talk project management, it's a bit of a reinvented view of project management, not the traditional. Um, see, it's high up. And this is public sector, private sector. We are all project managers, right? We know that, they don't know that. Now they need to know. Um, okay, so great. The project, projects are, are kind of ruling the world. Public, private, non-for-profit, but if you look at research, and this is very, uh, it's not, I would not say academic research, but every paper that you see about success in projects from Harvard, from McKinsey, from Brightline, from, it's poor, it's just, what, 70% of the projects fail. And each of these research is a bit fluffy, okay. But it's consistent, it's like 60 to 70% of the projects fail. And I'm thinking, which other profession has a, such a poor performance? Which other profession? There's none, right? And I didn't realize when I was at PMI, but if I knew and I would have reflected, this is the thing that I want to change, or we should change, is we need to change that. We need to really make sure that, well, 60% or 70 civil projects succeed. It's normal that we fail, we're innovating, of course, but not, and I'm not blaming anybody, but it's just a, something that is recurring and it's annoying me and we need to do something. So, imagine you work in the healthcare sector and you in, in operations and seven out of 10 patients die. Sorry, that's normal. If you're lucky, you're one of the three. Or imagine you're flying airlines, yeah? <laughs> Sorry, seven planes crash. Uh, three he survived. So if you're lucky, you'll get your project, uh, it will be successful. Uh, what a disaster, no? So, it's a, so a very high level, again, not very academic, but if you look at the reasons for project failure, we can group them in three sectors. There's a mind, three areas. Project management, the mindset of the project manager, the methods that we use. Just one third, we, we get all the blame for sure. It's just one third, okay? Senior leaders, one third or even more is their fault, okay? They are not prepared, they're not trained. They don't know what they need to do. They, they just, they're prepared to run the operations. They operate the day to day, the activities, not the change, not the projects. And then that leads also to the organization, we just saw that. For 20 years I've been doing projects, transformation. I always, maybe you relate to this, I always wished that these people there, the senior leaders, will go for a training to understand what is to be a sponsor. Uh, I wish, then I started to pray, hopefully, because they're not doing the work, they're not showing up in the meetings, they don't have a clue. Uh, and then I realized now with the book that I wrote with HBR, I say, we need to change that. These people will never get trained. Maybe the new generation that goes to MBAs and business schools and academic will start to understand, but this is five, 10, 20 years next in time. So my vision when I teach, when I speak is, okay, do your stop there, project manager, but get the senior leaders involved, grab them. One thing that you need to do before your project scope, get the senior leader and put them in your project and tell them, listen, CEO, I need you in this project. If I don't have you, this project will fail. So it's a mindset shift. The priority is not there. The priority for project leaders are the senior leaders. And I offer them coaching. CEO, I can coach you, I can teach you what you need to know, what you need to do to help me to succeed. Okay? The same here. Yeah, these guys or ladies, I influence this part. So I tell them, listen, we need to change the culture. We need to be more agile in this part of this project. So it's a very different, uh, scenario where, where, which I learned that wait and pray and hopefully the senior leaders will go to a training. No, that will never happen. Okay, we need to get and grab them. Even before you define the cost of your project, get them. Okay? Um, and then the other thing, it's, uh, I love to reflect and, and think about different things, but 
you hear disruption, disruption, disruption everywhere. But I've been like talking in PMI and project management and everywhere in project management. We never talk about disrupting project management. How is that possible? We disrupt everything but no project management. We were poor performance. It doesn't make sense. No, I think we need to be a bit more self-aware, um, self self-critics. The world is looking at us, so if we don't change, nothing will change and somebody else will take the space. So I think there's a sense of urgency here. Oversimplifying. So I just come up with three quick ideas. Um, we all love this, right? Triple constraint. We love that. First thing you learn anytime when you go to project management, of course. And it's great. I'm not going against what is great. I just think we need to rephrase, reshape it. I don't know what's the right word. Looking, I love to research projects around the world. I ask every MBA student to look at the project and analyze. And I have like a, a database of three, 4,000. Um, and I, we come across this case very often. This is a project which was scheduled for four years and was planned for seven million. It took a little bit more than four years, 14. And it costed a little bit more than seven public sector money. It took 102. What a disaster. What a disaster. Who didn't stop that project? Who didn't fire that project manager, right? That project should have never come to him. According to performance, terrible. Well, I'm talking about the Sydney Opera House. How can we say this project was a disaster? There's something wrong. There's something missing, right? So we miss, I'm not saying that the triple constraints are important, but, and, and we need to keep them, but we miss the benefit, the value, the, gen the impact in society. It's something that has not been developed, even if you have benefit management already for 20 years, but people are not using it. Maybe it's too complicated, maybe it's not accurate. But this is the main drive. That's why we do projects, not because of that. We do projects for there. If you cannot do that, don't do that, right? And, and unfortunately, methodologies, trainings, and so on focus on that part, which is a good foundation. And then something that I was amazed is that most successful projects everywhere is the people side, right? You have a team which is engaged, which is happy, which is challenging. I see that with this conference. Uh, Maria and the team, the volunteers, how much time did you put? But you like it because you're seeing the result today. Uh, the team makes a project succeed. And where is that in our formulas? Where is that in our frames? Where is that? It's nowhere. We start to talk a bit, but it's not the fundamental, the core. So uh, I think we just need to expand and shift the focus. You can have great this part, but if you don't have that on that, that project will fail. Don't spend more time, right? That's what we've been doing for about 40 years. Love this one. This one, one of the silliest battles and more negative battles in the world of processes, projects, and methodologies is this one. Uh, there was a reason for Agile. There was a different world at 2001, and, and it makes sense. But over 20 years, we've seen so many companies saying, either you do Agile or you do Waterfall. One or the other. One or the other. And if you do Agile, you're sexy and it's great, but oh, your digital transformation will fail, but who cares? Uh, and if you do the traditional Waterfall, it's, you're old. Come on. <laughs> And you need them both. You need them both. We need most of the digital transfer, the big transfer in COVID-19. That was a hybrid model. The use agile, some part of the clinical trial and the phases. And, and then you had some tragic program management. And so I think we need to shift off embracing all this. For me, that's what I call a deep generalist, that we know which tools are out there. I'm not going to be an expert in Agile, in Lean Six Sigma, and so on, but I know, and I love program management, but I know which parts of my program can be done in Agile. And if we're creating a new business or a new hub, let's use Lean Startup. What would you try to plan it before doing it, right? So I think that's the type of skills and mindset that we will you know, in every organization, in every sector, in every public or not private, it's embraced it. And, and I'm sure here there's more change management, product development. It's a tool set. It's like you have a tool set at home when anything gets fixed. You just don't have one hammer to fix all the problems. That's what we've been doing for 20 years, putting hammers 
on organization to fix all the problems. That explains a bit the failure rate. Another thing, this is a hospital in Brussels, Belgium, where I'm based, and I pass there regularly. The hospital was starting construction in 2016, completion 2020, four years, for Brussels is quite good. They're super bad in projects, uh, take forever. Some of them, they never finish. But to my surprise, 2018, I was passing by and there's like balloons and celebration and I stopped, by break, I, said, I turned, I said, they were up in the hospital two years in advance. I said, what? And they were, so the ground floor, first floor, second floor were operational. They had patients. Babies being delivered, the third, fourth lay floor, we're, we're still constructing, I think. Wow, you can do that with an app, you can do that with a website, you launch it before it's ready, but the hospital, and it's not two different business, it's the buildings, it's the same. And I said, this makes so much sense. Why don't we do it before? Of course, you make life hell for this person, the project manager, because now you have patients, you need to work in hours which are not great, but who cares? Right? Who cares? We're bringing benefits faster. Not in four years, two years. And that's one of the biggest challenge for me for project managers. It's not the time, the scope, that's great, that's important. The biggest challenge is how can we deliver impact and value and benefits faster? That's the biggest thing. And we're not prepared. There's no really a lot of methods. If I would have a method, I would tell you. Uh, if you'd have a method, tell me and we write a book. Um, but no, it's something that really, it will be a game changer, okay? Uh, so no company, no organization, no public can wait for years anymore to deliver anything on their projects. Everything has to be fast. Of course, there's safety, there's quality, there's a lot of factors which make everything much more complex. Last point here, and we move into the last section. Um, <coughs> a friend of mine, uh, Cesar, we were kids playing together, fighting a lot in Madrid. He's uh, Atletico de Real Madrid, Atletico Madrid. I'm a Real Madrid fan, <laughs> so we were fighting every weekend, on Monday especially. I lost track of Cesar. Uh, I met him five years ago in a conference in Singapore, business conference uh, for senior leaders. I was speaking about my stuff, projects, project economy. He was talking about Microsoft and the cloud and something like that. And I realized, hey, Cesar, I've not seen you for 30 years. What? And you're vice president, like the biggest boss in Asia Pacific for Microsoft? Let's have dinner. So we went for dinner. We catch up. I talk about Real Madrid winning so much. Uh, and, but anyway, and then he, I asked him, tell me about your career. So he started sending Microsoft Office packages, the Word, Excel, in Madrid. He was a very successful salesman. And at one point, Microsoft wanted to go the ERP market. Um, and, uh, and they bought a company, they didn't have, the, so they bought Navision, a Scandinavian company, and they, uh, they asked Cesar if he wanted to manage the integration project. So he said, yes, I don't know anything about project management, but I'll learn and I'll do it. He did that very successful for three years. So the integration and the creation of the ERP business unit in Microsoft was a big success, led by Cesar. So I was very happy in the dinner, Cesar, you understand what I do and what we do. And I asked him, which project did you take after? They said, because that's, uh, did you take something more strategic or, and he told me, Antonio, no, I didn't take another project. I said, what? You didn't take other project after leading your project successfully? Are you crazy? This is what we do in this world. We finish a project, we do the next one. And he said, no, Antonio, why? I was the person that knew more about this business unit than anybody in Microsoft. I told my bosses I wanted to be the managing director of the ERP business unit. Why should I give it to somebody else? It doesn't make sense. Why on earth, if I'm the person that spent three years nonstop working on this project, I need to give it to somebody else? Can you explain? And I was not able to explain. I said, this is the way we do things. Well, in public sector, you do that. In consulting, you do that. But why within an organization you need to do that? We just kept replicating things and we need an explore. So there's nobody better prepared to run what we build than a project manager in some cases. Okay, so just telling a couple of things um, to this round. So this is the project life cycle that we learned, that we use. We ignore innovation. We don't know what happens. It's not covered. 
we just do execution. We ignore what happens after. We don't care. As soon as possible, we'll just throw it to somebody else to run it. And benefits, we put one or two KPIs, but hard to manage and monitor. That's the today. That's the last 40. 80% will be disrupted. 80%. That's the big disruption about project management. I think we need to play a role here in ideation, innovation. We need to be learning design thinking. We need to be facilitators. We need to be referees in organizations where we say, this idea is too early. We don't do it. This idea we can do with Agile. This idea we can do in startup. And only that one will do us a project. We'll do that, but the good thing is that, again, another topic that we don't talk a lot, maybe you do, I, I heard, met somebody talking about artificial, we have ignored technology in project management. We, we manage projects with softwares which are 40 years old. It's just insane. It doesn't make sense. So there are good initiatives, research being done on project selection. There's, I met somebody working on big data to make your plan WBS in five minutes instead of five weeks. Uh, all this reporting. I don't know any other profession where you spend half of your time chasing people to get data for your reports um, that nobody reads. <laughs> Yeah, so why don't we get a machine to do that and we do what matters, which is stakeholder management and, 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 and value creation. Um, and like I said, sometimes, why not, we should run what we build. Not all the time, but sometimes. And the benefits for me is that uh, most important. I'm a bit sarcastic, but I tell my people, don't bring me a project plan with deliverables or artifacts. I don't care. That's your problem. Bring me a plan with the benefits. When are we going to start getting that? And my next question, when are we getting the value? Second question, can you do it faster? What do you need from me to make it faster? How can we have more impact faster in society, in kids, in education? How can we do it faster? OK, better and faster. Um, I don't know how much time we have. I will rush through the list. Uh, who's? Go on. Sure. I'm not. I'm a project manager. I'd like to finish on time. I feel bad. Sure? Can I have 10 minutes? Sure? Okay. Because I'm going to make you work a little bit. And then we'll wrap up. So I, 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 I did business school. I love business theories. And what happens with this is that the most successful are super simple. Michael Porter, Five Forces. You can do strategy with your team. Without being a PhD in strategy or a consultant from strategy, you just get everybody aligned and can, can contribute, right? That's what you want to get engagement. Kotler, Philip, marketing, seven Ps. Super simple, seven Ps, you can define your marketing plan. Business model, Alex Osterwald and Pignon, good friends <coughs> from Lausanne. Uh, uh, the business model canvas, super simple, nine boxes. Uh, and you can have a good discussion about your current business or the next one. Agile. Agile was super simple. Just a couple of pages, 12 principles. And then the question, what is simple in project management? Do you know any framework that is simple? Do we know any framework? <laughs> I come from PMI, sorry, and I love, like I said, I think we are all family. Uh, but the PM Bog. Is 752 pages. Who's going to read that? Nobody. You will prepare for the PMP to try to read that together. But that's it. Who's going to read that? Do you expect your sponsor to read that? No. The stakeholders, no. So I, I think what happens is that we do our stuff great. I, I tell you, we can do better, but nobody understands. Nobody understands. We're isolated because it's, it's complicated with a good reason of being complicated. But we should not be sharing the complication with them. We just need to make it simple for them so that everybody can contribute. Uh, so that led me to uh, create the Project Canva just inspired by Alex and Eve from the Business Model. I said, we need to find a way to simplify. You need to keep everything, OK? Shape it, focus on value. On, on value. But <coughs> I just try to put everything in, in one page. So you have the why. For me, the why is. Is the most important. We often forget that. I think business cases are made to be approved. So nine out of 10 business cases are approved. And that, that's wrong. I think it's more about the opposite. It's about looking at options, exploration. But anyway, I introduced the concept of purpose. 
because I think people in projects get uh, motivated, engaged, excited, not because your project has a 6% return on investment. Anybody gets excited by a 10% return on investment or 15? No. People get excited, engaged because there's a higher purpose, because you're going to achieve something that matters. Even if this conference, just networking, meeting all of you, this is so much richer than whatever return on investment you plan. But we've defined project benefits often on the financial side, and we forget about what are we doing. And the worst thing is that we always talk about the system. We're developing new system, and we forget to say that we're doing this system because there's a reason for that. It's a good example, a project manager working in my company. I asked her, why are we changing this system? And she said, well, because the project is about changing and building a new HR system. And I asked her, why do we need an HR system, new one? She said, because this new system has um, a kind of community functionality. So, uh, and why do we need community functionality in our HR system? And she said, because our people are disengaged, they're living, they don't feel belonging. And with the community, they have communication and social media will be closer to them. And then I asked her, why do you want to have that uh, more engaged people? Because it's going to impact our company. We're going to be better. So you see, Sarah, you're moving from an HR system to a project that's going to create more engagement in our company. Why do we talk about the system? Who cares about the system? Who gets excited? Nobody. Talk about your project is about creating more engagement in your employees. And we're going to measure that in January with the annual survey. And our goal is to get 50% increase. That's the way we should be talking about projects. Always with the why. Never with the business case. Never with the deliverables. Is why are we doing the project. And if you cannot put a why in your project, don't do it. Stop it immediately. You're wasting time. And it's going to be painful. Here, of course, I wanted to highlight the role of the sponsor. The sponsor, if you don't have a sponsor engaged in a big project, it's a failure. Public sector, it's failure, 100% guarantee. So if you don't have that, stop the project and talk to that person. Then the rest of the things you know, and then the organization, the culture. So it's not perfect, but I think it helps. It's already used by many, many companies just to simplify, right? And if you don't mind, I want to do a small exercise with you. It's a video of three minutes, and we're going to use it, okay? You don't know anything about this project. Uh, it's a project which was very important in the Obama administration. They created a platform, an ecosystem, <coughs> which was giving access to all the lower and medium class uh, citizens uh, to healthcare, cheap healthcare. And they created this platform, healthcare.gov. So I have a three million video, just give you a little of background, and then we're going to look at the project through the canvas. Please, thank you. Just pay attention, three minutes. Healthcare.gov, as the website is known, has some serious glitches into 
you at system yesterday. Apologize for a website. Uh, so if we look at this project, you just have about three minutes and a half. We can all fill in this canvas like this, right? It's a mess. It's a disaster. The why makes sense. There's a higher purpose. That's great. We have benefits there. But the sponsor, nobody knows who's the sponsor. They're talking to the Minister of Health, and she has no clue. She should be like the person who knows about this governance. It's a mess. This scope is broad, it's the biggest website, but we all know that if you have a big uh, scope, just break it in pieces, right? It's not too complex. The time is unoffensive. You have all the money in the world. I think that shows also that not ha if you have all the money of the world, your projects might not succeed if you don't have all the elements. Quality, how come they didn't test it? It's just crazy. Risk management, where is the plan B? You do it every weekend when you do a park barbecue in the park, you have a plan B if it rains. Why these people cannot have it for the website? Procurement, what a mess. Nobody knows how many contractors were working there. Uh, stakeholders, the Republicans against, change management, put it on. And then you see the public sector here in the US, very, very slow, uh, bureaucratic for an IT project. So this is already telling you this project is going to fail, and you don't need to do it now. We could have done this analysis in January 2013, nine months before the launch. It would have been the same colors. But then who dares to go to Obama and say, Obama, your favorite project is going to fail? We can predict project failure. I'm convinced about that. And this tells you that this project will fail, unless you take action on all the red, right? For example, this one is difficult to challenge, but what would you do as project manager if the organization is low? I would go to Obama and say, Obama, listen, we need to go fast. We need to take decisions quick. We need a flat structure. Can you make an executive order for this project? I just move me out. Move me out from the organization. Put me in another different building. There we'll apply our policies and we go fast. That's what we need to do, not just complain, saying, well, processes and bureaucracy, no. Next, I talk to you quickly, the opposite, green, everything, COVID. What happened there? Co-creation, uh, higher purpose, saving people's life, right? Interesting, the CEOs who usually never spent a second in a project. I talked to the person in a, in a podcast from HVR. They had interviewed the CEO of Pfizer. 
And the person asked him, how much time did you spend on this project? He said, 100% of my time to develop the COVID. How much time do you spend in other projects? Never. So that's the solution. If you don't get the CEO working in a big project, that project is going to fail. What's my first thing to do? Go and talk to the CEO. Say, listen, I need your time. I need half an hour every two weeks. Sense of urgency, clearly hybrid approach. They were taking risk, a bit of agile, everything. A long-term partnership with uh, regulators even is possible. You can work with regulators and competitors, exactly what Mutu was saying. This is one of the biggest things that frustrates me the most, is if your projects are your future, why don't you put work, people working 100% on them? Why don't you get the best people to work on your future 100%? Why do they need to be 10% or 20% of their time with other priorities? I just don't get it. These people are useless in my projects. It's just making my projects slow down. Why can't you not extract like they did for this project? Let's take them and put them in a project space, 100% dedication. How a company with 10,000 employees cannot take 50 and put them in a project just to deliver a strategic transformation? I don't get it. If you can do a bit of research on that, that would be helping a lot of people because everybody's entrenched in their day-to-day -day operations, public, private sector. Um, OK, so clearly, you put the two canvases. And again, these canvases are for free. You can download. You can change them. Uh, you, you can see, you can ask a kid which project has more chances of succeeding. You don't need a 50-page document to prove that, right? It's there. And I'm not saying disregard the rest. The rest, we need that. But just we want to reach 80% of our stakeholders. We want to make them understand. We want them to contribute. So it's simple. In 20 minutes, you can teach it. Everyone understand the key elements. You can read it. You can communicate. People can come to So it's not the solution, but it does help. And the last thing, I think we've used projects to build things and to change organizations. But I think there has been a point where it misses that projects are more than just what we think they are. I think they are like a strategic tool for governments, for organizations, to make a better world. It's not just a project on time and cost. It's just the tool that can change the world. And, and they're cheap. It doesn't require, right? It's, it's something that we can do. But this, when you ask people, I, I come across people who retired, and they, I ask them, what was the most exciting moment in your career? 99% they tell me it was a project I work on. It was not my day to day, it was a project. Some people say this project failed, but I still remember. Some others say this was amazing. I really love that. It was a project. So I always, when I talk to senior leaders or people, I say, what is the one project that is going to transform your organization and engage your employees? What's the project that people, when they go home, and talk to their friends and families and I'm working on this project. It's not the purpose. The purpose is important, but the purpose without a project is useless. So what's that project? Is it sustainability? Is it about reducing waste? That's the project one. Is it about going to Mars in 2024? What project are you working on that makes you proud, that is challenging? And most of the companies cannot tell me that. We don't have that, but we have 1,200 strategic initiatives. Thank you very much. No, you need one. And the same for governments. I think I'm excited to go around the world and see sometimes I was in Egypt a month ago and they have a vision 2030. I say, wow, this is what I love. This is what, and people talk about Saudi. I, I'm going there now. I was there in Jeddah. People, everybody knows about 2030. Everybody. And it's exciting. Maybe you don't make everything, but it makes the people proud. I am in Brussels. So sometimes I talk with politicians there, I say, what's the project for Europe? And I tell them, big bunch, the last time I was excited, proud to be European, was when you introduced the Euro, because it was a project that was getting us together, stronger, breaking uh, uh, currencies to have one. I was proud, uh, but this is 20 years ago. What's the project that makes us proud today? Nothing. Well, Euro, Euro Song Festival, but that's a mini project. It's not a transformative. So I think leaders have not understood that projects is more than just delivering, changing, creating. It's a powerful tool 
that can change the world. I always say, if we would be in the table of COP26, United Nations Climate Change, they wouldn't need 26 to move and change. Yeah, we need to be in these places. We need to help people make change happen through projects. And that's it, and just a quick pledge, I, this I'm trying to say. One thing we need to do is double the success rate of our projects, regardless of where we are. Uh, because we'll increase credibility and we'll make a better world. So that's kind of uh, the end. And a lot of value generated GDP of China on a yearly basis, just like doing projects better. So that's it. Thank you. Sorry for running a bit later.